Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's about that time. Welcome to Simple Truth Church. We've got some new faces around. We've got some old faces around. It's good to see everybody today. Jeff Alloways is up working on the, the park fire today, so you got to look like two feet lower to see my face. I had an exciting week. It wasn't good exciting. There was a fire right near my house on uh, Wednesday afternoon. I was so sort of... Uh, in shock about it, so I didn't talk about it on Wednesday night, but uh, I was studying, I was getting ready, and my daughter ran out of the room, she's on watch duty or something like that, you know that app, hey, there's a fire on our road, and so we walk outside, and the first thing you see is the tank of planes circling, oh yeah, there's a fire, so it was like two houses up for me in the brush, I'm not sure exactly what, somebody doing yard work, and uh, I started dragging hoses and sprinklers up the hill, my wife started, you know, throwing stuff in bags and getting it in the van. And before I even got to my hill with my big old, I've got a metal stand with a sprinkler on it, you know, before I even got to the top of the hill, the tanker just comes blasting over the hill, almost giving me a haircut, you know. I'm not, I'm not a very emotional guy, but man, my, I was so excited to see that. It was so cool. I just dropped everything. I was like, yeah! I was... It was awesome. I was so excited. I didn't even care if my house burned down after that. It was so cool. And they did a couple more drops. Bulldozer rambled its way up my hill. Like eight or nine fire trucks rambled up the hill. And uh, it was cool. I've got a friend who is a private firefighter, which is a weird concept. He puts out fires on his own private fire truck. It's bizarre. He was hanging out with me because he came to help in case I needed help. And um, we just watched things happen. There was not really, it, it went from dangerous to not dangerous at all really quickly with the fire department. And then he left my house and there was another fire in Penn Valley like immediately after that. And he just saw smoke and drove to it, saved a house and then made uh, snow angels as they dropped retardant on him him and the, and the homeowner that were out there. I've got a picture I can show you. It's really cool. Um, he sent me a picture. He just looked like he just got bathed in Pepto-Bismol. And then, uh, so that was exciting. I went to the fair yesterday, which was less exciting. I'm not a fair kind of guy, but uh, it was fun to... <laughs> it was fun to see a bunch of people. I saw um, Jeff and Michelle over there, and it was... I went with uh, Katrina's son, Alex, and their family. And it was funny because we were, we were watching the pig race, which if you are going to go to the fair, don't bother going to watch the pig race because it's uh, a long, boring thing. <laughs> and so I was sitting in, in the bleachers with my kids, and we're in the full sun, and Alex is, is there next to me. He goes, man, I don't think I'm going to make it up here in the bleachers and their three-year-old daughter was getting hot. I said, go sit next to the Harders. I know them from church there in the shade. That'll be fine. And then after that, I pointed out to him the, uh, I saw Damien and Andrea Horn's family there. And I pointed out one of the girls, that's Damien Horn's daughter over there. He's like, oh, wow. And then Juan Brown, I don't know if you guys know Juan Brown. He was flying people over the fair. You could buy, you know, you could, for fundraiser, he'd fly you over the fair. And I pointed it out. Hey, there's Juan Brown in his airplane. And he goes, man, you know everybody. And I was like, not really. He goes, you just, the plane flew over and you knew that guy. Okay, you got me. Anyway, that was fun. Um, yeah. If you want to see the pig race, go like 15 minutes after they say they're going to start. And you don't have to listen to the guy talk for 20 minutes. And you just get to watch the pigs run around the little track. And then you can walk away. Announcements. I didn't mean to talk that much about stupid stuff, 
sorry. I don't really normally have exciting weeks, so there's... I was going to tell you, though, actually, I, I hurt my back, like, on Monday. And it's been bugging me all week, except for when my hill was going to burn down. And I it never felt better. I was, immediately felt fine. I could run up and down my hill and drag hoses, and then after that, it's hurt me again. We have a new announcement, and it's uh, an important one. Living Well Medical Clinic has a shopping list. There's stuff that they need. So if you've got um, you, new or gently used items, they need stuff like clothes stuff, um, diapers, wipes, all that kind of stuff. You can go to their website because I'm not going to read the list and you'd forget it if I did anyway. Um, but if you go to their website, which is, I don't have it here. Is it just Living Well Medical Clinic? Okay. Just Google it, right? And they've got uh, links to gift registries, and you can, if you don't have that kind of stuff, like I do, because it wasn't that long ago for us that we had babies in the house, so I can get rid of some of my stuff. But uh, if you don't, they have gift registries, and it can just ship directly to them. And then you actually know that you're fulfilling needs that they have requests for. So check that out. That's important in our community, especially if, if we're encouraging women to have babies instead of abort them, then it'd be, you know, on us to help them through that period of time. What do we got? Prayer requests. Um, I have a new one. It's not really new, but uh, sort of recent. Like I said, I was with Alex and uh, Katrina yesterday, and Katrina is going in for major surgery tomorrow they're removing three of her ribs. It's cancer related. The cancer is not in the bones. I was asking about that, but it was like on top of the bones. And so because it was like touching, they just are removing everything just so it doesn't come back again because it's come back before. So um, they're taking out ribs tomorrow down in Stanford. And um, I think after they evaluate all of that, they possibly will go back in and take more out Friday. So she's going to be in the hospital for, you know, weeks. And she requests lots of prayer. Um, she said, you can text, you can call. She doesn't really need visitors. She's happy to be <laughs> alone. And she said uh, she hopes to be as unconscious as possible for a whole lot of that. So... Keep her in prayer and go ahead and text her or call her. She, she probably won't get back to you very quickly, but she would appreciate it anyway, I'm sure. And uh, definitely keep her in a lot of prayer. I know that talking to her over the last, I don't know, four or five months since she's known this was coming up, God has already answered a lot of prayers for her. So let's just keep that up. Sorry, that's a major one. And it should have gone at the end when we're talking about other prayer requests, but I just saw it. We need uh, children's ministry volunteers, always, always, always needed. Uh, the other thing is that as Christmas is coming up, Kim wants to update our military registry of people that we pay for and we put on our, our list. So if you've got a service man or woman who's in the Army or the Navy or the Air Force or any of those, let us know and we can update pictures and any prayer requests and stuff like that. And then also, you know, we do stuff for them on Christmas. So go see Kim about that. Women's Tuesday morning prayer at Karen Kinney's. And of course, you can get a hold of her if you need emergency prayer. The men's Bible study, as uh, you guys are in Proverbs on Friday. How is uh, Bill? Bill had uh, heart surgery. He's doing well. He's doing well. Yeah, he's is he home? He is home and he has the first physical therapy. Awesome. So he's doing well. Uh, Wednesday nights, 5 o'clock, you can watch me live on Facebook if you like, or it's on YouTube later on. Uh, we're going through First Samuel like we're going to do this morning. I had 87 people watch last week? That's weird. You watched 87 times? 
<laughs> John's in the back pointing at himself. Okay. Are you wanting me to tell, say that the audio is better? The audio is better. It was really bad for a long time, and I know that. I don't know if it was something I did, because I started using a ear thing, um, or if something that Facebook updated, but the audio was a lot better, and you can actually hear what I'm saying, which is, yeah, good to do. Looking ahead, um, Ray Balmer is going to make a, uh, a library, a mobile library, so you can check out books. Where's Ray at? I saw you. There he is. Um, pastor approved, it says. Cool. I, I haven't heard about this, so that's cool. Talk to... There's what? Oh, there's a box of books on the table already. Awesome. Cool. It's already going. Um, oh, wow. Jerry Berger. You guys remember Jerry, right? He says he, he had a heart attack yesterday, cold blue. He was resuscitated and quickly underwent surgery. He had two stents put in. One of them was placed in the artery, referred to as the Widowmaker. It's a miracle he's alive. He's in ICU in a Kentucky hospital. Pray for peace for Nancy as well. Wow. Okay. So we'll keep him in prayer. That was just yesterday. Yeah. Um, Bill McIntosh. We just talked about him. Bill and Kathy Ford's son-in-law. He's looking at uh, a seven-month recovery time after his uh, surgery. But he's home, and he's very thankful for prayers. It says, Kathy's brother, Jeff, uh, he's an atheist, and he was in nine hours of surgery to remove his bladder and have reconstructive surgery and rewiring of his intestinal system, but the cancer is gone. Well, that's a praise, repo- uh, praise report, but we need to keep praying for him. Um, looking down a little bit further, Jen Triplett is continuing to improve and is looking forward to go home soon, possibly within the next few weeks. And, of course, her daughter, who donated port- a portion of her litter liver, Cassie is continuing to improve as well. So a lot of people to pray for. That's kind of a longer list than we normally have, especially with Katrina in there. So we're going to be praying for them and also for the uh, men and women of the armed forces and our local first responders, including the Pin Valley Fire Department. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we're thankful for so many things that we do have to be thankful for. Lord, I'm thankful for the, the local first responders that we have with our uh, fire departments and uh, CAL FIRE and the, uh, the Sheriff's Department and Highway Patrol and all of the people who come together to, to help people in our county. And Lord, I pray that you would continue to bless those men and women. I pray that you would continue to keep them safe and healthy. Lord, I also want to lift up our, our armed forces as we always pray for for those guys and girls, Lord, who are out um, taking care of us, Lord, we appreciate them, and, I, and we also pray for their health and their safety. And, uh, Lord, for those among us that we have talked at, at extent about who have physical needs of healing, of peace, of uh, safety, Lord, I pray that you would be with all of those situations that we discussed, Lord, that you would be the healer, that you would be the father who would take care of your children and, and that they would know that peace and safety. And Lord, now as we come before you in this place, we're thankful that we could have this building to be in, Lord, and we want to just fill it with your worship. So be glorified in us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's- Then Jesus' blood and righteousness Dressed in just the sweetest frame But holy trust in Jesus' name Christ alone, cornerstone Weak made strong Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide. 
His face I rest on His unchanging grace In every high and stormy gale My anchor holds within the veil My anchor holds within the veil Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When He shall come. in His righteousness alone, Father, stand before the throne, Father, stand before the throne, Christ alone, cornerstone, weak, made strong. Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak, made strong in the same.
darkness is like the mighty mountain. Your justice flows just like the ocean tide. And I will lift my high voice to worship you, my King. And I will find my high strength in the shadow of your I will lift my high voice to worship you, my King. And I will find my high strength in the shadow of your wings. Your love, oh Lord, reaches to the heavens. Stretches to the sky.
Lord, once again, we find ourselves in your presence, Lord, and we confess we need you. Lord, we are not enough on our own. Lord, only you can be our Savior. Lord, only you can make us adequate to come into your presence. So, Lord, I pray that as we do so still more, Lord, as we worship you in your word, Lord, I pray that you would be our teacher, that you would speak through to us, Lord, and that you would show us how we can take your word and apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, during worship, somebody reminded me of um, an old friend, Gary Freeman, who is in Texas now, and um, speaking of Jerry Berger, he said that uh, Gary Freeman is also knocking on heaven's door right now, so we're going to lift up Gary. Lord, I thank you for uh, Gary Freeman and the influence that he's had on so many lives in this room, including my own. Lord, I pray that you would be his comforter now, Lord, and, and all of his family, Lord. I pray that you would give them peace, that you would remind them of the hope that they have in Jesus, and that you would uh, take Jerry home, Gary home with uh, minimal pain. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. We're going to be in... Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17 this morning, and we get to look at the story of David and Goliath, which is funny because when I covered for Jeff last time, I was thinking, oh, that's too bad. We don't quite get to David and Goliath yet, and I was kind of bummed out, and I just have to do that on Wednesday night, you know, which is fine. That's great, but then God just worked it out. Here we are. We're going to talk about David and Goliath. It's interesting, um, as we've been talking about David, as he's sort of appeared on the scene in 1 Samuel after God told Saul that he's no longer going to be the king, we've seen David be anointed. Uh, we saw him get basically plucked out of obscurity to come and serve in King Saul's court as his, basically his minstrel. He's going to play music for Saul when Saul needs some encouragement. Um, all of those things, David is very much in the background. He's a very completely passive character that we have come across. He doesn't really do anything. Everything happens to him. And so for us, he's been behind the scenes. For Israel especially, he's been very behind the scenes. Nobody knows who he is. Well, that's all about to change as we read about David and Goliath. We talked about this, the setup of this big battle uh, last Wednesday. The Philistines and Israel were at war, and they met in the Valley of Elah. And on the sides of the valley, on both sides, we had the camp of the Philistines and the camp of Israel. And neither side wanted to go down into the valley to start the battle because then they'd be fighting uphill, right? So every day and every night, actually, Goliath of Gath would walk down into the valley and taunt Israel and trying to, tried to uh, get them to send out a challenger so that they could resolve things that way, right? But Goliath was just ridiculously huge. It, like, you read the, the dimensions that they had in the Bible, and then you translate them into what we understand. And of course, like, the cubit was not... A, a cubit, I think, was the tip of a, a man's pinky to his elbow, which is different for every man, Right? So it's not exactly a hard and fast system. So Goliath, according to our dimensions, would be anywhere from nine and a half feet tall to ten and a half feet tall. That's a big difference, but it's still, I mean, nine and a half is enough. And, uh, you know, he's, he's out there with, like, armor that probably weighed more than David, just walking around with that casually. Um, I, I talked on Wednesday night about this website that I found while I was doing some research. It's called goliathspear.com, and somebody took the dimensions that they gave in the spear and talked about how heavy the spearhead was, and it was the, the shaft was like a weaver's beam, and they, they got weaver's beams from that period of time, um, and they made a balanced weapon with a 15-pound spearhead on the end of it, and it's ridiculous. It's huge. And Goliath's out there 
challenging, hey, let's bring me a man and we'll go to single combat. And it, it, Goliath's unbeatable. Nobody is going to be able to walk out onto that field of battle and fight this guy. And my personal opinion is that nobody thought that that was going to happen anyway. I think that Goliath was down there as bait. And the Philistines wanted Israel to do the only logical thing, which was overrun Goliath. They had to overwhelm him by numbers, right? Because nobody's going to be able to take him on hand to hand. And then they'd have the uphill advantage. So that's my theory about that whole thing, but it doesn't really matter. Because nobody was willing to go down and fight. Uh, Saul kept offering more and more stuff. Uh, I think by the time David shows up on the scene, he's offering his daughter's hand in marriage. He's offering a whole bunch of money. And, you know, you can live as a libertarian for the rest of your life. You don't have to pay taxes. <laughs> but still, nobody's going to go. I mean, who's going to get to enjoy that when you've got a hole like this through your body because of Goliath's spear? And then David arrives on the scene. And when we say that, you got to know David was not arriving on the scene as like special forces. Like, oh, we brought in the expert to come and do this. David was, he arrived on the battlefield because he was bringing food to his older brothers who were serving in the army. Uh, the minimum age for being a soldier in Israel was 20 years old. So he was very likely younger than that, probably by a bit. So he was his dad's sort of courier to bring bread for his brothers and cheese for their commander so that they would get, you know, possibly not put on the front line against Goliath, I guess. So he shows up and he hears Goliath taunting Israel and mocking God down in the valley. And he, he's just dumbfounded. And I forgot to include this. Actually, I decided this morning to include this verse. Sorry. This is... Um, 1 Samuel 17, verse 16, when he hears what, uh, no, sorry, verse 26, when he hears what Goliath is saying, it says, And David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? So David shows up and he hears these mocking words from, from Goliath, and he's dumbfounded. He can't understand how anybody is allowing that to happen. Why are we letting this Philistine use these words about our God? And what, how come nobody has done anything about this? David understands that God loves his people. David understands that God is going to take care of and protect his people. He's not going to let a man walk out in front of Goliath and be slaughtered as, you know, an example of how God takes care of his people. He knows God is going to take care of this guy. And then if you get to be used by God in this way, you also get to marry the king's daughter. You also get a whole bunch of money. You also don't pay taxes for the rest of your life. Why is nobody else handling this? And his, his brother Eliab, the oldest brother, is like, come on, David, shut up. You're just a little punk. And He's looking at it, like, are you stupid? Like, if you're not going to get on this, then I am. And that's when David got into a little bit of trouble because Saul heard about his, uh, his words that he was willing to go and fight. So here we pick up in verse 31. When the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart faint, fail because of him, your servant will go and fight this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. So again, we talked about this a little bit on Wednesday night, but this conversation that he has with Saul is important because before David could go and overcome Goliath, he had to overcome his brother Eliab, and then he had to overcome King Saul. And Saul was pretty excited when he heard that there was somebody, anybody, who's willing to go and fight Goliath, because this is day 40 of the standoff, and hearing Goliath come out and taunt Israel, and nobody's willing to stand up. Finally, he hears there's somebody here who's willing to go and fight Goliath, and he's, he's excited until he sees who shows up. It's this little guy, David, and oh man, this isn't going to work out after all. I, 
and he, he describes David, and nothing about this is inaccurate, right? He's, he's evaluating what he sees. This isn't going to happen. It's not going to work out. And it's, it's, he's not telling any lies. David is a little kid. He's not on the battlefield because he's too young to even serve in the army. He's puny. And he's unqualified. He has no experience. And then you've got Goliath out there who's been killing people for a living forever. And so there's nothing false about what's, what Saul says to David. But Saul was evaluating David as a man sees, right? And he could not see David the way that God saw him. And we talked about this when David was anointed in verse 7 of chapter 16. It says, The Lord sees not as a man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And David's heart is going to matter in this battle a whole lot more than his height or his, his arms or anything else. And when we read David's response to Saul, we get to see the heart that actually mattered in this battle. Verse 34 says, But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep with his father. And when there was a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went out after him and struck them and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. So as Saul was evaluating David, you have to know, or he will had to have recognized that, hey, by this sort of evaluation, if it's size that matters, if it's experience that matters, then Saul is the logical choice to go out and fight Goliath, right? He is, was uh, already been described as the, the largest man in Israel, right? He's not, a, he's not nine and a half feet tall, large, but he's the largest man in Israel. He's got more experience than probably anybody else because he's been leading Israel's armies now for years. And so by that logic especially because he's the king. The whole point of the king was that he was supposed to be Israel's champion. He should be the one who's out there fighting Goliath. But David makes this point that, hey, you know what? Size and experience are not going to matter the way that this fight's going to go. He says the only factor that is going to matter is the God factor. And Saul had forgot about the God factor. All of Israel had forgot about the God factor. And it's kind of funny because in that sense, the king of Israel, all of the army of Israel, they were no better off than Goliath of Gath because everybody forgot that God is the one who's going to fight for Israel, except for David. So David tells these stories about when he was a shepherd boy. And these stories about fighting lions and bears, they were not meant to make him look like this mighty warrior. They weren't meant to be like this brag of, hey, I can kill lions by hand. I can kill bears by hand, and so I can kill anything. It doesn't matter. David was not trying to make those claims. What he was saying was, I have been outmatched. I'm outmatched against a lion. I am outmatched against a bear, and I have experienced for myself how God delivered me when I was outmatched. You know, I've got goats, and I've had goats eaten by lions, like within the last two months. And I, I think about my boy out there, any of them. If, if you were out there and a mountain lion came down and started eating one of our goats, I do not want you to go out and fist fight that lion, right? Because you're outmatched. I would not want to go fist fight that lion. Not without a gun. Then I'll fist fight him. But when David was out there with his sheep, and he saw the lion, he saw the bear come down. He knew that, that David the shepherd boy didn't matter in this equation. David the shepherd boy didn't matter against the lion or the bear or anything else because he knew that God was on his side. And when he went out and he put himself in that situation, of course, it was God who was the determining factor. And it doesn't matter what the equation is. As soon as you get God into the equation, that is the only factor that matters in any problem. 
And so David says, listen, if God had no problem delivering me from a lion, if it was not hard at all for God to deliver me from the bear, then it doesn't matter who else is on the other side of that equation. If it's God versus a bear, God's going to win. If it's God versus Goliath, then God's going to win again. And so David basically is taking himself out of the equation. He's just saying, it's not going to matter. It's going to be God who's going to fight for me. And so he got permission from Saul, but Saul still wasn't really on board with what David was saying. Verse 38. Then David, sorry, then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor, and he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. So David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off. Then he took a staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. So Saul was still thinking in human terms, right? And he, he wants to give David some sort of chance against Goliath. And in his way of thinking, I've got the best armor, I've got the best sword in the camp, I should at least give them to David. If he's going to go fight, he at least gets some kind of chance. And again, I, I have a hard time faulting Saul for that. Like that, humanly speaking, that makes sense. Right? If I'm going to send my 10-year-old boy out to go fight a lion, I'm at least going to give him my gun, even if that's a really stupid decision to make. Right? Here, have a chance. You need to be armed. And... That's kind of what Saul is doing here. But Saul is the largest man in Israel, and David is a boy. And so he puts on all this stuff, and he's like, I can't even move. I'm not going to be able to go out and, and fight in this. And to me, this is actually where the battle of David and Goliath was won, right here when he's talking to Saul. Because it's obvious that, that David and Saul had different ideas about how this battle was going to go. For Saul, no matter how ridiculous the chances were of David overcoming Goliath and winning, he at least should have this sort of physical chance to fight. But it's obvious that he did not think that God was going to be of help to David at all. David, on the other hand, knows the only way I'm going to be able to win is if God shows up. And so this stuff, it's not actually going to matter for me. It's not going to help. And again, go look at that spear. Goliathspear.com. It's a funny website, but it's out there. It'd be like wearing like catcher's gear and then getting hit by a semi-truck. It's not going to help you. It's not going to stop that spear. So David rejects this, this armor, and he, instead he goes out and he gets his stick and he gets some rocks and he gets his sling. He doesn't go out empty-handed. And I had to wonder, why would he do that? Because if it was only God that mattered, if he didn't need any kind of weapon or armor, why would he go and get the stuff that he's familiar with? And I think it's purely that. It's purely because that was stuff that he was familiar with. It's interesting being a servant of God, right? Because God doesn't actually need us to be his servants. When God uses people, it's not because he is inadequate in some way and he needs us to make up for what he can't do on his own. God likes to use us as his servants despite who we are, not because we're so great. And so when God uses us, it's like he's, he's picking up the tool to use. And, you know, in my garage, I've got hammers, I've got saws, they do different things. And you don't take those into the house and use them to cook dinner. You use different tools for all of that. And each tool has its purpose. They don't look much like each other. They don't perform the same function. God calls us and he gives us the abilities that he has given us. And sometimes we hear God's call and we think, I can't do that. I can't do that because I've seen how that's done and I can't do it that way. And so then you don't, you know, listen to God's call because you can't share the gospel with your neighbor the way that Billy Graham would do it. 
You know, I've seen how that's supposed to go, and I can't do it that way. I'm not, I'm not that guy. But here's the secret. Billy Graham needed to rely on God the same way that David needed to rely on God, the same way that you're going to need to rely on God to do the things that he calls you to do. And here's another secret. Billy Graham is dead, and you're not. And if God wants to use you, he's going to, despite who you are. Not because you have all of these skills, but because he's great, and he can do all those things. You know, and, and the hammer and the saw, all of those things, they look different, they, they do things differently, and they don't have any skill. They don't have any power. They only are effective because the builder picks them up. The builder supplies the power. The builder supplies the skill. And so if we're going to be used by God as his servants, if David is going to be used by God as his servants, it's because he's going to be used the way that he is, not the way that he wishes that he was. And so Saul knows, sorry, David knows, he can't go out and fight the way that Saul would. He can't. It's good that Saul had armor and weapons and all that stuff, but it can't, be work, it can't work for David, not at this point in his life. And so he doesn't go out to fight like Saul. He goes out to fight like David. And it's just like when, when Jesus was out on the desert and he had all the disciples out there and this huge crowd showed up. And Jesus spent the day healing them and teaching them. And at the end of the day, he says, hey guys, let's serve all of these people dinner. There's 5,000 people out there. And the disciples looked at Jesus and they said, Jesus, we can't do that. There is no Costco out here. There is no place anywhere in Israel that even sells this amount of food to feed all of these people. If we had the money to buy it, no one would be able to sell it to us. But one of the disciples found the little boy who had a couple fish and a few loaves of bread, and that's what Jesus was able to use. And so inadequacies don't actually factor in the problems anymore. Right? As soon as you add God into the problem, that's the only factor that actually matters. And so this is how it's going to go with David. He doesn't take the armor or the sword. He just takes the things that he knows how to use, and that's what he brings out there. Verse 41. And the Philistine moved forward and came near to David and his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he, he disdained him. For he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give the bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that, by all, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. So Goliath sees this little boy coming out with a stick and he reacts the same way that a lot of the world reacts to us when we go out to serve the Lord. And I feel like these jabs that Goliath makes about David's appearance and his stick in his hand, they probably had the whole camp of the Philistines laughing, right? They're, they're mocking David and humanly speaking, again, it's correct, right? David is a little boy with a stick and, and Goliath is an Abram's tank. Like, forget it, man. Just go back home. But David says the same thing that he's been saying all day long at this point. Like, it doesn't matter what you've got. He, he lists all of the strategic deficiencies that he has. He's, you've got all of these weapons. I have none of that. And yet, you forgot about God. God is going to give you into my hand. You and all your friends are going to be bird food today. And he explains, look, it's because you put yourself on the wrong side of the most powerful name 
in the universe. You defied God. It's not me who you're fighting today. So forget about the stick. It doesn't even matter. You're fighting God. Verse 48. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face on the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a, with a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and Judah rose with a shout and pursued the Philistines as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron, so that the wounded Philistines fell on the way from Sharim as far as Gath and Ekron. And the people of Israel came back from chasing the Philistines and they plundered their camp. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem and put his armor in his tent. Imagine how shocking this would be to watch this all go down. You know, they're on both sides of this valley. Everyone's got a view of what's going on down there. And everyone's probably watching there thinking like, this is going to be horrible. We're going to watch this giant take apart a little boy in this valley before us. And then all of a sudden, it's just boom, over. Not the way that they thought. If you guys ever watched hockey, you ever watched? It's really, really, really difficult to actually watch hockey if you're trying to find the puck. You, you can't see it. It's moving so fast, and usually somebody's stick is holding it. And so I think that's probably what they're watching. Like, the only way you can understand what's going on in a hockey game is if you learn to read the positions and, and the posture of the, the hockey players. And that's, that's how you know what's happening, because you're never going to follow, follow the puck with your eyes. And so all of these people are probably trying to figure out what David and Goliath are actually doing down there. They see David doing this, and all of a sudden Goliath's on the ground. What just happened? Did he fall? Like, did he trip him somehow? And then Goliath just stops moving. And David runs over, and he takes this probably barely able to lift its sword out of Goliath's sheath, and they're like, oh, this is a weird strategy. What's, what's Goliath going to do next? Oh, oh. And David's like, ah, I got it. Enormous head. And think about the Philistines. This are just like, oh, uh-oh. And they panicked and ran. And for Israel, how quickly their fortunes changed. Their old king was hiding in the camp. Their old king was completely unwilling to go out and, and face Goliath. And then their new king arrives. They don't even know who this guy is. But he's been anointed their king. And he walks out and tells them all, you guys forgot about God. You guys forgot that God fights our battles. And then he puts his own life on the line to prove it. And it works. And instead of cowering in fear for over a month in their camp, they are scattering dead Philistines everywhere, and then they plunder the camp. And then David lugs this head back home. Can you imagine David's dad? I sent you out with bread, and you brought this back. What happened? I guess I've got boys. I know kind of what that's like. And in all of this, David is not given to us as this sort of on a pedestal, unattainable figure that we're supposed to worship or adore and wish we could be like him. He's not given to us like that. He's, he's an example for us to follow because we're, we're not anything. David wasn't anything. He was just a guy who was willing to say, yeah, God can do that. I can't. But that doesn't matter if I can or I can't, because God can. And he wants to do the same thing for all of us. I, I know people who are battling all kinds of crazy things, battling addiction, battling depression, trying to figure out what their life is going to look like after they lost everything. How am I going to put this back together? I mean, Katrina's going into surgery. They're going to take a huge portion 
of her body out of her tomorrow, and she's going to be fighting that battle. But just the same way that Goliath was God's fight, not David's, all of those things that we face, those are God's. God came to us and he said, I'm going to bear your burdens. Put my yoke upon you. And let's pull together. That's what that means. Everything that we have to face, and there's a lot, right? I'm not trying to minimize that stuff because I've, I've fought a lot of those battles. I still do fight a lot of those battles. And it's not nothing. Goliath was not nothing. But God wants to help us. God wants to get through it on our behalf. And all we have to do is trust and rely on him. This is Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And again, when you put God into the equation, that's the only factor that matters anymore. It's like when you multiply something by zero. It doesn't matter what other number you multiply by. It always ends up as zero. It's the only factor that really matters, right? And, you know, I don't know what sort of battle is going on in your life. Some people I do, some people I don't. And I'm sure that if you've told me one of your battles, there's a whole lot of other ones that I don't know about. But... I know that there's not anything that doesn't fall under that category of all things that you can do through Christ who strengthens you. And even though the challenges that we face, they tower above us the way that Goliath towered over David, they don't tower over God. And you don't have to be big enough or strong enough to fit into Saul's armor. You don't have to be somebody different than who you are. All you have to do is put yourself in God's hands. Trust in him to be the one who's going to fight your battles for you. I've got a couple more verses. Some of them are long to read, and then we're going to sing again. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. For though we walk in the flesh, and we do walk in the flesh, right? We do still have the battles that we have to fight. Though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. And this is Romans 8, verses 31 through 39. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with With him graciously give us all things. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is it to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of Christ Jesus our Lord. None of these things is able to separate us. And when you get into those situations, like I know... I've known a lot of you for a long time and I've seen the struggles that you face and then you find a new one and it's like, man, this is overwhelming. I am not going to be able to, to overcome this. Be like David, not just in the way that you trust the Lord, but recite the battles that he's already won for you, right? When he was faced with Goliath and he said, hey, he's brought me through it already. He's already shown me that I can fist fight a bear with him on my side. That's not something that that happens without God. And if he can get you through that, he's going to continue all of the things that could possibly come against us. He's, we've made more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Jesus, what can we say but thank you? Thank you for being our champion. Thank you for fighting on our behalf. 
Lord, you proved that there was absolutely nothing that you would withhold on our behalf, that you would go to any length. When you died on the cross, you showed that there was nothing that would, would stop you from helping us. Lord, and if you would go so far as to die for us, Lord, I know that you're going to continue to help us through all of the struggles that we face, all of the problems that come up against us, Lord, whatever giant we might have to fight, Lord, we know that you are in our corner. And you're the one who supplies the wisdom. You're the one who supplies the strength. You're the one who's going to supply the victory for us in this battle. Lord, help us to be like David, trusting in you. Help us to follow in his footsteps as we remember all the ways that you have given us victory before and trust in you that you have not changed. That you are still on our side, that you're still going to fight for us and help us to have faith in your power. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing one last song. There's no one like you, none like you. Into the darkness you shine, out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you, none like you. Our God is great. Stronger, God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. And into the darkness you shine. Out of the ashes we rise. No one like you, none like you. Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God, our God is greater. Our God is stronger, God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? Then what could stand against? Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God, and if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us, and if our God is with us, then what could stand against, and if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us, and if our God is with us, then what could stand against? Then what could stand against? Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher. Healer, 
cool to get to sing those words after uh, seeing it in action with David and Goliath. I, how many times have I like given this long message and then like, man, we could have just sung that song and then be, I, why did I have anything to add to that? <sighs> anyway, let's, uh, we do have to stack chairs today. Somebody decided school starts uh, in the middle of the fair. Um, but keep uh, Katrina in prayer tomorrow especially. Um, and don't forget the Living Well needs. Find their website, livingwell.com, I get whatever. Google it and see uh, the, the ways that God can use you to supply needs that are above us. Have a great, great week, guys. God bless you. <laughs>